first to you all tonight mm. for one of the books that shaped America. It's a series of 88 books chosen by the Library of Congress curators that they think over time shaped conversations in America. And there'll be, there are books on this list. This is one of the outliers from some of them, but other books on this list are Dr. Spock. So many of us were raised by our mothers who thought that that was the way to raise babies. Um, Julia, Child's, the Joy of, Julia Child's cookbook is on there, The Joy of Cooking is on there. A whole lot of books that you don't typically think of as great literature. And many of these were not great literature and they were not prize winning, but they started conversations or they affected the way people lived their lives. And so we circulated this list to faculty members and said, is there a book that you would like to lead a discussion of with the community, with students, with whoever shows up. And we've had faculty members sign up for lots of books. So we will be doing this again um, next year, and we have two more books yet this, this season that we will cover. But tonight, mm. it is The Iceman Cometh. And since O'Neill was the son of an Irish immigrant, it seems <coughs> St. Patrick's Day would be a good night to do this. And our discussion leader tonight is Professor Carl Coppola. Coppola? Coppola. Coppola, sorry. Who is an assistant professor of theater and musical theater in, in his 12th year here at American University. He holds a BA in drama from the University of Montana, a master's of fine arts in acting from Wayne State University, and a PhD in theater and performance studies from the University of Maryland. Luckily, he is volunteering his time because he is a proud member of Actors' Equity. He has, he, he has worked professionally throughout the country for the last 28 years as an actor and a director. His local work includes Everyman Theater, Rep Stage, Ford's Theater, Olney Theater, Virginia Shakespeare Festival, the Baltimore Shakespeare, Shakespeare Festival, Imagination Stage, Journeyman Theater, Adventure Theater, and the Bay Theater Company. For AU, he has directed The Alchemist, Guys and Dolls Company, the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Oklahoma, Tartuffe, Country Wife, You're in Town, Hamlet, The Mystery of Edward Drood, Of Thee I Sing and Kiss Me Kate. And later this month, um, Maxim Gorky's The Lower Depths will be performed at AU's Greenberg Theater on March 26th through 28th. His scholarship focuses on 19th century American theater, and his book, the Acts of Manhood, the Performance of Masculinity on the American Stage between the period of 1828 to 1865 was published in 2012. With that, there's, there's going to be a slight difference to tonight's. It's not just conversation. Professor? <coughs> Thanks. All right. So, um, we're going to intersperse some scenes from the play uh, throughout the, the talk this evening, just so you get a little bit of variety. Um, my scene partner will be Jordan Halsey, uh, who will be, uh, he's a, a current AU student who will be graduating in 2016. Um, so, the setting is a dive bar in Greenwich Village in the summer of 1912. Um, this is a scene between an older man and a younger man. I will be playing the older man. Uh, the older man is Larry Slade, who's a regular in this bar. Uh, the younger man, Don Parrott is a newcomer. Uh, he and his mother were part of the anarchist movement. Um, and there was a bombing. Um, and most of that group ended up being arrested and somebody on the inside informed on them. The newcomer has come to the bar looking for help from the older man. Um, the older man was a former anarchist. Uh, he was a former mother of the young man's mother and uh, was a former father figure to, that, to the younger man. So, our first scene. Hello, Larry. Sit down and join the bums. I've been in some dumps on the coast, but this is the limit. And what kind of joint is this, anyway? What is it? It's the No Chance Saloon. It's Bedrock Bar, the end of the line cafe, the bottom of the, of the sea Rathskeller. Don't you notice the beautiful calm in the atmosphere? That's because it's the last harbor. No one here has to worry where they're going next because there is no farther they can go. Although, even here, they keep up the appearances of life with a few harmless pipe dreams about their yesterdays and tomorrows, as you'll see for yourself if you're here long. What's your pipe dream, Larry? Oh, I'm the exception. I haven't any left, thank God. 
Don't complain about this place. You couldn't find a better for lying low. He, how is it that they didn't pick you up when they got your mother and the rest? I wasn't around. And as soon as I heard the news, I went undercover. The papers say the cots got them all dead to rights. That they knew every move before it was made. And someone inside the movement must have sold out and tipped them off. Yes, I guess that must be true, Larry. It hasn't come out who it was. It, it may never come out. But God... I know they're damned fools, most of them, as stupidly greedy for power as the worst capitalists they attack, but I'd swear there couldn't be a yellow stool pigeon among them. Sure, I'd have sworn too, Larry. I hope his soul rots in hell, whoever it is. Yes, so do I. How did you locate me? <laughs> I hoped I'd found a place of retirement where no one in the movement would ever come to disturb my peace. I found out through Mother. Uh, I asked her not to tell anyone. She didn't tell me, but she kept all your letters, and I'd found where she'd hidden them in the flat. I sneaked up there one night after she was arrested. I've never thought she was the kind of woman to save letters. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. There was nothing soft or sentimental about Mother. What made you leave the movement, Larry? Mother always thought it was on her account. But you know her, Larry. To hear her go on sometimes, you'd think she was the movement. That's a hell of a way to talk after what happened to her. But don't get me wrong. I, I wasn't sneering, Larry. Only kidding. I've said the same thing to her lots of times, and to kid her. But you're right. I know I shouldn't now. I, I keep forgetting she's in jail. It doesn't seem real. Listen to me. I'll thank you to keep your life to yourself. I feel you're looking for some answer to something. I have no answer to give anyone, not even myself. Unless you can call what Heine wrote in his poem to Morphine an answer. Lo, sleep is good. Death is better. In sooth, the best of all were never to be born. That's a hell of an answer. <laughs> Still, you never know when it might come in handy. I don't suppose you've had much chance to hear news of your mother since she's been in jail? No, no chance. Anyway, I, I don't think she wants to hear from me. We had a fight just before this business happened. She bawled me out because I was going around with tarts. She said she wouldn't give a damn what I did, except she'd begun to suspect I was too interested in outside things and losing interest in the movement. And were you? Sure I was. I'm no damn fool. I couldn't go on believing forever that the gang was going to change the world by shooting off their loud traps on soapboxes and sneaking around blowing up lousy buildings or a bridge. <laughs> I got wise was all. It was a crazy pipe dream. The same as you did, Larry. That's why I came to you. I knew you'd understand. You know how I feel, don't you, Larry? So, the Books to Shape America series um, is uh, sponsored by the way. Oh, yes, yes, please. Oh, gosh. We have so many of these coming up, you'll want to save your thunderous applause for the end. Um, uh, so this was sponsored by the Library of Congress. Um, and the idea, uh, just based on the title, that do, does anything really shape America, I think is a challenging question in itself. Um, I, I suspect that the relationship at best may be a little bit more reciprocal uh, as far as how, um, how works interact with society. Um, I think that probably more often that um, books and plays tend to more reflect the time um, that they are in. But, but anyway, the, the a librarian of Congress, uh, James H. Billington, said the list is intended to spark a national conversation, uh, as was mentioned before, on books written by Americans that have influenced our lives. And I have to say that this play, at least on an artistic front, uh, had a definite impact on me. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation. So uh, there were 88 books chosen. Uh, well, they couldn't come up with 12 more, apparently, in order to make it an even hundred. 88 was the magic number that they had to find. Um, out of that, three were plays. Uh, the, the theater professor in me finds that somewhat irritating. Um, however, I, I'm also, I also sort of question whether they are looking at these plays as literature or whether they are looking at the a theatrical event, um, which is two very, very different things. Um, it's very, very rare for a play as literature to actually have much of an impact. Most people don't go around reading plays other than perhaps the ones by Shakespeare. And so, uh, and he's, I don't think he was an American. And so, um, so uh, three plays. Uh, we have Thornton Wilder's Our Town, which is 1938. We have um, 
this, that other one. A Streetcar Named Desire, uh, which is 1947. And then we have The Ice Man Cometh, which was written in um, 1939, the year after Our Town, but it's not produced and published until 1946, the year before A Streetcar Named Desire. So these three plays happen within a nine year span. Um, but that's it. So no Death of a Salesman, no Angels in America, no August Osage County, no Arthur Miller at all, no August Wilson, no Sam Shepard, no David Mamet. Um, so it, it's interesting as far as what it is they chose to focus on and who they decided to, uh, to honor with whatever this honor is. And so uh, this interesting conversation anyway. And I'm not even sure with these three playwrights, Thornton Wilder, um, uh, Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams, if these are even necessarily the three works that we would select from those three playwrights. But uh, interesting anyway that we have these three uh, from this nine year period, which I think is probably the most fertile era of American theater um, that has happened in our country up to this point. And so uh, during this time period, we have the great masterworks of Tennessee Williams and, and Arthur Miller, um, Odette's Inge, the work of the group theater, which is so influential both in the literature that's written as well as in how it is performed. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing time period. Especially if we look at two of these works, Our Town, and I Spend Cometh. There's some really interesting parallels that exist between these two. They're written within one year of each other. Um, Our Town is set in the fictional Grover's Corner of New Hampshire, and it's set between the years 1901 and 1913. It's a meta-theatrical work, meaning it calls attention to itself as a play, and it, uh, it basically follows everyday life, kind of mundane, everyday, middle-class life, working-class life in New England. Um, and I think the overall message of this play is that we should embrace every moment of life, uh, that every moment of life is precious. Um, so written one year later, we have The Ice Man Cometh, which is set in a bar in Greenwich Village uh, in 1912. So it falls within the same time period as our town. Um, it's hyper-realistic, um, and essentially the message of, of Ice Man Cometh is that we need our illusions in order to survive in what has become a cruel and meaningless world. So we have two radically different worldviews happening at exactly the same time, as far as when they're written and the time that they're looking back on, kind of the, the youthful moments of the playwrights that created them. So it's interesting to sort of look at that. So we have these. Out, out of curiosity, um, and with no judgment at all, has anybody actually ever read this whole play or seen a production of it? Well, good, wow, gold stars for you. Um, so it's... Uh, it was just pr produced off-Broadway. Uh, it closed day before yesterday. Um, just produced off-Broadway with the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It starred uh, Brian Dennehy and Nathan Lane. And uh, its running time was four hours and 45 minutes, which is almost too much of a good thing. <laughs> that is a whole lot of O'Neill. Um, so it is, a, it is a very, very long play. Um, if you do the script uncut, it really can't be done in any shorter amount of time than that. Um, so it tends to run between four and a half and five hours, um, which is sadly not that unusual for O'Neill. But all right, uh, and, and uh, so I'm going to look at a, another scene. Uh, this will be with the same pair that we saw the first time, the older man and the uh, the younger man. So we'll see what they have to say for themselves now. Oh, they're going to talk about the character of Hickey. Um, Hickey is a traveling salesman, and he is somebody who is known for bringing like a good time to the bar. But he has shown up this time sober and um, vowing that he's going to change everyone. So. Do you know, Larry, you're the one of the mother cared most about? Anyone else who left the movement would have been dead to her, but she couldn't forget you. I used to try and get her goat about you. I'd say, Larry's got brains, and yet he thinks the movement is just a crazy pipe dream. She'd blame it on booze getting to you. She'd kid herself that you'd give up the booze and come back to the movement tomorrow. She'd say, Larry can't kill in himself a faith he's given his life to, not without killing himself. <laughs> How about it, Larry? Was she right? I suppose what she really meant was come back to her. She was always getting the movement mixed up with herself. But I'm sure she must have really loved you, Larry, as much as she could love anyone besides herself. But she wasn't even faithful to you, was she? 
That's why you finally walked out on her, isn't it? I remember that you got mad and you told her, I don't like living with a whore if that's what you- You lie! I never called her that! It made home a lousy place. I felt like you did about it. It was like living in a whorehouse, only worse because she didn't have to make her you live You bastard! In. She's your mother. Have you no shame? No. She brought me up to believe that family respect stuff is all bourgeois property-owning crap. Why would I be ashamed? I've had enough. No, no, don't leave, please. I, I promise I won't mention her again. I can't go on like this. I've got to decide what to do. I've got to tell you, Larry. I won't listen. All right, I won't. Don't go. Who do you think you're kidding? I know damn well you've guessed. I've guessed nothing. But I want you to guess now. I'm glad you have. I want you to understand the reason. You see, I began studying American history. I got admiring Washington and Jefferson and Jackson and Lincoln. I began to feel patriotic and love this country. I saw it was the best government in the world where everyone was equal and had a chance. I saw the ideas behind the movement were, came from a lot of Russians and meant for Europe. But we didn't need them here in a democracy where we were free already. I didn't want this country to be destroyed for a damn foreign pipe dream. I began to feel I was a traitor for helping out a lot of cranks and bums and free women plot to overthrow our government. And then I saw it was my duty to the country- You stinking rotten liar. Do you think you can fool me with such hypocrites can't? I don't give a damn what you did. It's on your head, whatever it was. I don't want to know and I won't know. But I never thought mother would be caught. Please believe that, Larry. You know I would never have- All I know is I'm sick of life. I'm through. I'm drowned and contented on the bottom of a bottle. All things are the same meaningless joke to me. So go away. You're wasting breath. I've forgotten your mother. The old philosopher, eh? You lousy old faker. You old bastard, you'll never die as long as there's a free drink of whiskey left. Look out how you try to taunt me back into life. I warn you. I might remember the thing they call justice there and the punishment for... I'm old and tired. To hell with you. You're as mad as Hickey and as big a liar. I'd never let myself believe a word you told me. The hell you won't. Wait till Hickey gets through with you. Mm -hmm. So, what's it all about? I'm gonna tell now, at this point, when you're um, already don't know what's going on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the plot of the play. Just so we understand sort of where it is if we start. So, uh, act one, we are introduced to the denizens of Harry Hope's Saloon, uh, which is sort of this, this dive bar in, uh, in Redditch <laughs> Village. Um, uh, everybody's waiting for the arrival of Hickey. Everybody's talking about it. So he's a traveling salesman who always brings a good time. He buys drinks for everybody, and he always comes for Harry Hope's birthday, which is going to be the next day. And usually the party starts right at midnight. And so they're all waiting for him to show up. Um, uh, he also is somebody who is known for joking about leaving his wife in bed with the Iceman. Uh, and so that's sort of a, a common joke, and obviously one of the, the main references of the type that we keep hearing. Um, each of the inhabitants reveals the pipe dream that sustains them. Uh, and so we have a fallen carny, a police officer, a law student, a colored gambling house operator, military leaders, writers, anarchists, pimps, and whores. Um, this odd mixture of people, all of whom are dreaming either that they are better than they are somebody else or imagining a tomorrow where their lives are going to be better than they are now. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the character of Larry Slade, the older character that I play. Um, he is a former anarchist. Uh, he claims to be the only one, actually, without a pipe dream. He pretends to be this detached philosopher, um, though the characters refer to him as a philosopher um, all the time. Um, and he seems to be just watching from the grandstands, watching in kind of a detached way, waiting for the big sleep death uh, and that can't come soon enough. Um, we have the young character of Don Parrott, who comes in as a newcomer into this bar, coming in seeking help from Larry Slade. Um, he's a member of this anarchist group um, that was guilt, uh, responsible for a bombing, and most of the group members were, um, it turns out, were, were arrested. 
And so then we find out that Don Perry, the son of the leader, the female leader of this movement, was the one who, um, who told her. So. In Act 2, we finally get Harry Hook's birthday. Uh, because at the end of Act 1, Harry Hickey has, uh, uh, Teddy Hickey has shown up, finally. And he's sober, which is very unusual. He usually arrives drunk and keeps getting drunker. And he's saying he's going to save everyone from themselves and make them basically get rid of their damn foolish pipe dreams. So Act 2 is the actual birthday party, but nobody can enjoy themselves because Hickey has made them all apprehensive and self-conscious. Even champagne, which is this remarkable rarity for them, can't cheer them up. Um, basically, Hickey starts calling everybody on their pipe dreams, uh, which then start to disintegrate. And Parrot then reveals to Larry that he informed on his mother, um, though he did it for patriotic reasons, which is the scene we saw earlier. And then Hickey reveals that his wife, Evelyn, died. Ooh. So then we get to Act 3, um, where everyone is forced to confront their pipe dreams, and all of them do. There are 20 characters in this play, all of whom have a pipe dream, all of whom say what that pipe dream is, and all of them individually lose that pipe dream and tell us about it. Uh, and so that's what happens in Act 3. Everybody confronts their pipe dream. They all actually do what they say they've always wanted to do, or what they're going to do tomorrow. Um, tomorrow suddenly comes today, and they actually attempt to do it. Um, and so those illusions then shatter. And so the result is fear and rage and retreat. And everybody ends up back at the bar, dejected and defeated. Um, let's see. Uh, Parrot reveals the pragmatic reasons for his betrayal, which was that he wanted money for prostitute. Um, and Hickey reveals that his wife, Evelyn, was actually murdered. Wow. <laughs> then we move to Act 4. Um, and everyone is now despondent or angry over the loss of their dream and their hope. Um, even alcohol can no longer deaden or relieve that pain. Um, and they all keep talking. They're all drinking and drinking and drinking. Ideally for this, we would have had um, whiskey. At the, <laughs> they wouldn't do, do that. Um, but it, by the time we reach Act 4, it is an astounding amount of alcohol that everybody is drinking. And they're all talking about that there's something wrong with it. It doesn't have this usual effect. And so, um, Parrot then reveals that he betrayed his mother because he hated her. Um, Hickey reveals that he actually killed his own wife. And he first claims that it was for her own good and that he did it out of love. Um, but then he ultimately reveals that he hated her. Um, and then he claims insanity. And the group jumps on this insanity defense as an excuse to go back to their pipe dreams. And so all 20 of them reclaim individually their pipe dreams. But that's why the play takes four hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> because he does that with each individual character. Um, and so uh, this play is... and then. At the end of the play, everybody sings. <laughs> Seriously, this long, depressing play ends and everybody's singing. But what, the, what the actually happens, and this is brilliant, is they all are singing a different song. <laughs> so it's like 15 different songs that are happening. So it's just this huge cacophony of joyful noise. Um, but it's all discordant and odd, and, um, which is it's a really brilliant idea. Um, we don't really think of O'Neill plays really ending in song. Um, <laughs> though, of course, um, the, it's because most of them don't know about the suicide that just happened. Um, so, the play is very long, uh, it's uh, close to five hours, um, which is not unusual for O'Neill. He did have some, a few plays that were even longer than that. He actually tried to cut 45 minutes out of the play in order to take it a little bit easier on the audience, but he said that he couldn't. Because he said that that repetition was absolutely necessary to the plot, um, that you had to get that repetition in order to understand the deadening aspect of their life. And he also said that you had to hear what everybody individual dream was, how they lost it, and how they reclaimed it. You had to hear that for each individual character. Frequently, when this play is revived, um, they will cut portions of the play. They'll get it down, under, they'll get it down to like three hours, um, which means that they are cutting an enormous amount of the play. Um, and they're cutting a lot of the repetition, and they eventually shorten or eliminate some of the characters. Uh, and even in the, I think it was in this current revival, I think they eliminated one of the characters. I think they eliminated one, and it still ran four hours and 45 minutes. Um, O'Neill claimed that we have lost the faculty of sustained attention, that these kind of these great works require. Um, and he blamed it on television and film, which is probably not um, unfair. So, let's see. Let's look at something else for a minute. All right. So, uh, I'm going to now do a, another little speech from uh, the Hickey character. And listen, everybody. I know every one of you inside and out by heart. I may have been drunk when I've been here before, but old Hickey could never be so drunk he didn't see through people. I swear, 
I'd never act like I have if I wasn't absolutely sure. Get rid of the damn guilt that makes you lie to yourselves about something you're not, and the remorse that nags at you and makes you hide behind lousy pipe dreams about tomorrow. You'll be in a today where there is no yesterday or tomorrow to worry you. You won't give a damn what you are anymore. I wouldn't say this unless I knew, brothers and sisters. This piece is real. It's a fact. I know because I've got it here, now, right in front of you. You see the difference in me? You remember how I used to be, even when I had two quarts of rock gut under my belly and joked and sang Sweet Adeline, I still felt like a guilty skunk. But you can all see that I don't give a damn about anything now. And I promise you, by the time this day is over, I'll have every one of you feeling the same way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, the Iceman cometh in production. Uh, we have here the 56 re uh, revival. So, uh, the play is again written in 1939, um, and, but they again not produced until 1946. Um, it, it is directed by a guy named Eddie Dowling, who three years earlier directed and starred in Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie. Um, and uh, designed by Robert Edmund Jones, who is the greatest designer of this era. Um, Marlon Brando famously auditions for this play, and he turns down the role of the young man, Don Perry, um, because he said he thought the play was written poorly. Uh, he then, the next year, does a play called Streetcar Named Desire, another one on this list, and I heard he did fairly well for himself after that, <laughs> so uh, kind of interesting. Um, I Say Cometh was the last play produced on Broadway in O'Neill's lifetime, um, the original production was ultimately really not a disaster. It was okay. The man who played Hickey, got an actor named James Barton, uh, was basically just ill-suited for the role. His voice kept giving out, and Hickey has what is roughly a 25-minute monologue at the end of the play. Um, and so, uh, and also his emotional complexity that he was capable of, because he was somebody who was known for playing a lot of comic roles. Um, uh, he basically just wasn't up to playing the emotional demands of the role either. So, uh, the play was, did okay, but wasn't considered to be a, a great work. Um, shortly after O'Neill dies, uh, a director named Jose Quintero goes to O'Neill's widow and asks if he can do the Iceman comic. It's only been 10 years since it's been on Broadway, um, and so it's unusual to revive a straight play that soon. But um, she gives him permission, and uh, a young Jason Robards um, stars in that production. Um, and he was far too young for the role at the time, um, but the play becomes an enormous hit, and then Jose Quintero, the director, and Jason Robards then become known as these great interpreters of O'Neill. Um, and so uh, it was produced at a very intimate 200-seat Greenwich Village Theater, um, which used to be a nightclub. So it's this ideal location for a play that's set in a bar. That's really nice about staging scenes from it, too. Uh, all of, they're all sitting at a table. <laughs> that's nice. Um, uh, it ran 565 performances, which is the longest run for an O'Neill play before or since. Um, I, I think in many ways, in 1956, audiences were ready for a little post-war despair and um, existentialism. This is the same theatrical season that Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot um, plays in New York for the first time. So, um, so it sort of uh, hits kind of the right moment. Um, and this revival of Iceman Cometh really sparks a revived interest in O'Neill himself. Um, the play is considered to be like this revelation, seeing it in that way, um, which is why it runs for such a long time, because everybody has to see it. And uh, it sparks this interest in O'Neill. Uh, they next do um, A Long Day's Journey into Night, the most autobiographical of his plays, um, and that becomes an even greater success. And then they do uh, A Moon for uh, Miss Begotten, which had been a failure when it was done in the 40s, but it was hugely popular in the 1950s. And so all these works all of a sudden solidify O'Neill's reputation as a, as a playwright uh, and as a, art, this great artistic figure. And it's really because of the revival of Iceman Come Up in 1956 that does that. Otherwise, I think he always would have been considered sort of this has-been um, playwright from a previous time. Um, there is a, an off-Broadway revival in 1973 with James Earl Jones as Hickey. Um, there's a 1985 uh, off-Broadway revival that is again directed by Jose Quintero and again stars Jason Robard, so almost 30 years after this production, they do it again with much less success. Um, in 1990, there's a Chicago production with the Goodman Theater uh, with Brian Dennehy 
as, um, as Hickey. And uh, so that is considered to be a, a really successful production. Then in 1998 and 99, uh, a production goes from London to Broadway with Kevin Spacey. Uh, and the play wins the Tony Award for Best Revival of a Play. Um, in 2012, Chicago's Goodman Theater does it again. This time with Brian Dennehy playing the role of Larry Slade that I've been reading, um, and uh, Nathan Lane playing the role of Hickey, who was considered to be an odd choice for that role, because he's primarily known for playing comic roles. Uh, but he really apparently brings this great life, and um, uh, kind of life at the party, and great um, command as an entertainer uh, to the role. Uh, and that production just closed off Broadway. Well, it was a planned six-week run, so it didn't close because of lack of success. Though I would imagine that um, because it was running four hours and 45 minutes, um, people's attention span for that, that's, that's probably more than twice as long as most people are willing, willing to sit for a play now. Um, so, yeah, so it just closed uh, day before yesterday. Um, it was filmed twice in 1960 as a TV play of the week um, that starred uh, Jason Robards four years after he did this revival. Uh, and Robert Redford, in one of his very first film roles, plays um, the Don Parrott character. Um, then it's filmed again in 1973 with Lee Marvin as Hickey, and uh, Jeff Bridges, in one of his first film roles, plays Don Parrott. Um, and it's also the final film for Frederick Marsh and Robert Ryan. Um, it's a four-hour film, um, so they cut almost an hour out of it. Out of it. Um, the, the previous 1961 was a, a three-and-a-half-hour film, so they, they cut um, even more. So, yeah, it's a, a, a lot of a lot to love. So, all right. Oh yeah, there's the image from the original Broadway production. Uh, and there's me, Mark. All right. So uh, we're going to do another scene from the the older man and the younger man, um, Don Parrot and Larry Slade. Did you get that, Larry? This damn fool thinks the cops are after me. I wish to God they were. And so should you if you had the honor of a louse. And you're the guy who kids himself he's through with the movement. You old lying faker, you're still in love with him. I think I understand, Larry. It's really mother you still love, isn't it? In spite of that dirty deal she gave you? But hell, what did you expect? She was never true to anyone but herself in the movement. But I understand how you can't help still feeling, because I still love her too. You know I do, don't you? You must. So you see, I, I couldn't have expected they'd catch her. You have got to believe me that I just sold them out to get a few lousy dollars to blow in on a hoard. No other reason, honest. There couldn't possibly be any other reason. For the love of Christ. If you don't keep still, you'll be saying something soon that will make you vomit your own soul like a drink of nickel rot gut that won't stay down. To hell with you! Don't go, Larry. You've got to help me. Okay, so, uh, some inspirations uh, for the play. Um, there are uh, some literary antecedents. Uh, Ibsen's The Wild Duck in 1884. Um, we have basically there an entire family that is, their lives are built upon a lie. And this idealist comes into their household um, determined to reveal the absolute truth. And this idea of a comforting lie versus a harsh truth um, is something the realist movement uh, deals with very effectively. Um, and so, you know, the, the truths are revealed, life becomes miserable, it ends in suicide, and the duck dies. Uh, and so, um, uh, the play that probably then has the greatest impact is Mac Maxim Gorky's The Lower Deck in 1902 which is a masterwork of Russian socialist realism. Um, it basically looks at a group of social outcasts, all of whom um, are using lies about their past, their present, and their future in order to get through the, the difficulties of their, uh, their existence. Um, and uh, um, this strange spiritual pilgrim comes into their environment um, and basically brings them a sense of greater hope also largely through lies. But then that stranger leaves, everyone is confronted with the truth, life becomes miserable, there's suicide and death. Um, so, uh, O'Neill was a huge fan of Maxim Gorky and of the Lower Deaths. Um, it, he always talked about it as a direct inspiration for this play. And you have a rare opportunity to see this, what is a fairly rarely performed work, next weekend. 
at the Greenberg Theater, March 26th to 28th, that I, I directed. So my name's right there. <laughs> uh, that I, I directed, uh, and they are in rehearsal right now without me. And I'll be going to rehearsal when this is done. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so it's interesting to sort of look at that. Uh, and again, it's that idea of, of I mean, this is a, uh, something that is also a pervasive theme in the lower depths, is this idea of the lies that people use in order to survive. Um, and so, interesting. So the year uh, it's set in 1912, uh, uh, Eugene O'Neill's uh, I spent coming, it's set in 1912, um, which is the year of his suicide attempt. Uh, he had attempted to combine sleeping pills and whiskey, which is not good, typically. Um, the title, I spent cometh. We have the archaic cometh, um, which is meant as both a kind of a biblical as well as a poetic reference. Um, the um, death cometh, cometh to us all. Um, but we also have, um, it's also based on a dirty joke of the time period. So a man calls upstairs to his wife, uh, has the Iceman come yet? And the wife yells back down, no, but he's breathing hard. <laughs> so we have here in the title this mixture of the exalted and the vulgar that exists. Um, and uh, so I think that's fascinating as well. Uh, the Harry Hope Saloon is based on a couple of different, about two or three different bars in New York, uh, in the Greenwich Village area that existed during that time period. Um, the characters, many of them are based on real life figures of this time period. Though I'm not going to tell you about most of them because they're um, but O'Neill said of them, basically, I knew them all. I've known them all for years. Um, a couple that I will mention, there is a character named Jimmy Tomorrow, which is based upon James Finlatner Blythe, who was uh, his father, James O'Neill's press agent, and who's actually the one who sort of rescues him, uh, Eugene O'Neill, from his suicide attempt. Uh, Blythe then, the following year, in 1913, commits suicide himself by jumping off the fire escape of the bar, which is exactly how the Don Parrott character dies. Um, Don Parrott, is, uh, the young man, is based upon a, a character named Donald Vose, who was the son of a woman anarchist um, who was part of a group that was responsible for the McNamara bombing in L.A., and he actually informed on his own mother, and so that's part of that. Hickey killing his wife is based on um, a prominent newspaper editor of the time period, and in 1918, um, Charles E. Chaplin, uh, no relation to his dreaded son-in-law, um, but Charles Chaplin shot his wife in the head um, and claimed that he did it for her own good and out of love for her. Um, and this interesting idea of guilt and hatred of the wife-mother figure is something that on, you see, it's a common recurring motif in a lot of O'Neill's work. Uh, he had a very troubled relationship with his mother. Um, and so here, the two mother figures, neither of whom appear on stage, uh, one is dead and one they basically talk is figuratively being dead. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's also sort of the naming of some of the characters. We have Harry Hope. Um, obviously, people come to the bar for Hope. Don Parrott. Uh, Parrott, he kind of parrots or echoes the Hickey storyline. And he's also a character who basically can't think for himself. And he can only basically parrot what it is he's heard from other people. All right, we have another little scene from our dynamic duo. <laughs> Larry knows I'm here, all right, although he's pretending not to. He kept himself locked in his room until a while ago, alone with a bottle of booze, but he couldn't make it work. He couldn't even get drunk. He had to come out. There must have been something there he was even more scared to face than he is Hickey and me. I guess he got to looking at the fire escape and thinking how handy it was if he was really sick of life and only had the nerve to die. He's thinking of me, too. Trying to figure out a way to, to get out of helping me. He doesn't want to be bothered understanding. But he does understand, all right. He used to love her, too. So he thinks I ought to take a hop off the fire escape. For God's sake, Larry, I've got to know what I ought to do. God damn you. Are you trying to make me your executioner? Execution? Then do you think... I don't think anything! I suppose you think I ought to die because I sold out a lot of loudmouth fakers who were cheating suckers with a phony pipe dream and put them where they ought to be. In jail? <laughs> don't make me laugh. 
I ought to get a medal. What a damn old sap you are. All right. So, um, a couple of things. Uh, this play does follow the, with nobody know the Aristotelian unities of time, place, and action. Everything takes place over the time that it basically uh, takes up. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, time breaks in between each act, but, it's, but otherwise it's an hour of real time happening within the bar. Um, it all takes place within the same physical location, and it all follows one action through all four acts. Um, it's, it goes from comedy to tragedy. Um, O'Neill said that this was the funniest play he ever wrote, which would be sad. Um, uh, it's also interesting the way the play kind of represents a, a, almost a musicality. The recurrence of themes are almost like the motifs of a symphony, how they weave in and out, and his use of different voices and the range of dialects are kind of like musical instrumentation. Uh, and so we have um, an Irish, Scott, English, Dutch, Russian, African American, heavy New York, and Midwest accents that are all sort of combining uh, into this interesting musical motif. All right, so um, we have a, a, another scene. This is a, a sort of a scene sort of between uh, Parrot and Hickey. Uh, who are each trying to convince um, the rest of the bar and Larry Slade um, and, tell, and kind of informing us sort of what it is that happens to the wives and mothers. I saw I couldn't kill myself like I wanted to for a long time. She'd have died of a broken heart. She'd have blamed herself for it too. Or I couldn't just run away. She'd have died of grief and humiliation if I'd done that to her. She'd have thought I'd stopped loving her. But as it was, there was only one possible way I had to kill her. And now they can send me to the chair. Wouldn't I deserve the chair too? If I... It's worse if you kill someone and they have to go on living. I'd be glad of the chair. It'd square me with myself. I wish you'd get rid of that bastard, Larry. I can't have him pretending there's something in common between him and me. It's what's in your heart that counts. There was love in my heart, not hate. You're a liar. I don't hate her. I couldn't. And it had nothing to do with her anyway. You ask Larry. You see... Even as a kid, I was restless. You've heard the old saying, ministers' sons are sons of guns? <laughs> well, that was me, and then some. Home was like a jail. I hated everybody in the place. That is, except Evelyn. I loved Evelyn, even as a kid. And Evelyn loved me. I loved Mother Larry. No matter what she did, I still do. Even though I know she wishes now I was dead, you believe that, don't you? Christ, why don't you say something? Yes, sir, Evelyn always stuck up for me. She wouldn't believe the gossip, or she pretended she didn't. Nothing on earth, earth could shake her faith in me. Not even I couldn't. She was a sucker for a pipe dream. I never could learn to handle temptation. My playing around with women, for instance, it was all only a harmless good time to me. Didn't mean anything. But I'd know what it meant to Evelyn. So I'd say to myself, Never again. But you know how it is. Traveling around the damn hotel rooms, I'd get seeing things in the wallpaper. I'd get bored as hell, lonely and homesick. <laughs> but at the same time, sick of home. And Evelyn always knew about the tarts I'd been with when I came home from her trip. She'd kiss me and look in my eyes, and she'd know. She forgave me, even when it all had to come out in the open. I picked up something from a tart in Altoona. The quack I went to got all my dough, and then he told me I was cured, but I wasn't. And poor Evelyn. But she did her best to make me believe she fell for my lie about how traveling men get things from drinking cups on trains. <laughs> anyway, she forgave me. The same way she forgave me every time I turned up after a periodical drunk. I could see disgust having a battle in her eyes with love. Love always won. She'd make herself kiss me as if I had, as if nothing had happened. As if I'd just come home from a business trip. I suppose you think I'm a liar. That no woman could have stood all she stood and still love me so much. That it isn't human for any woman to be so pitying and forgiving. Well, I'm not lying. And if you had ever seen her, you'd realize I wasn't. It was written all over her face. Sweetness and love and pity, and forgiveness. No, wait, I'll show you. I, I always carry your picture. No, I'm forgetting. I, I tore it up afterwards. 
I didn't need it anymore. I burnt out Mother's picture, Larry. Her eyes followed me all the time. They seemed to be wishing I was dead. Christ, I loved her so. But I began to hate that pipe dream. I even caught myself hating her for making me hate myself so much. I got... So sometimes when she'd kiss me, it was as if she did it on purpose to humiliate me, as if she'd spit in my face. But all the time, I saw how crazy and rotten of me it was, and it made me hate myself all the more. And as the time got nearer to when I was come here to do for my drunk around Harry's birthday, I got nearly crazy. I kept swearing to her every night that this time I really wouldn't, until I made it a real final test to myself and to her. And she kept encouraging me and saying, I can see you really mean it now, Teddy. I know you'll conquer it this time, and we'll be so happy, dear. And she'd say that and kiss me. I'd believe it, too. Then she'd go to bed, and I'd get thinking how peaceful it was here, sitting around with the old gang, getting drunk and forgetting love. Joking and laughing and singing and swapping lies. And finally, I knew I'd have to come. And I knew if I came this time, it was the finish. I'd never have the guts to go back and be forgiven again. And that would break Evelyn's heart because to her, it would mean I didn't love her anymore. That last night, I'd driven myself crazy, trying to figure some way out for her. I went in the bedroom. I, I was going to tell her it was the end. But I, I couldn't do that to her. She was sound asleep. I thought, God, if she'd only never wake up, she'd never know. And then it came to me. The only possible way out for her sake. I remembered I'd, I'd given her a gun for protection while I was away, and it was in the bureau drawer. She'd never feel any pain, never wake up from her dream. So I killed her. You may as well confess, Larry. There's no use lying anymore. You know, anyway, I didn't give a damn about the money. It was because I hated her. And then I saw I'd always known that was the only possible way to give her peace and free her from the misery of loving me. I felt as though a ton of guilt was lifted off my mind. I remember I stood by the bed and suddenly I had to laugh. I couldn't help it. And I knew Evelyn would forgive me. I remember I heard myself speaking to her as if it was something I'd always wanted to say. Well, you know what you can do with your pipe dream now, you damn bitch? No. I never... Yes, that's it. Her and her damn old movement pipe dream, eh, Larry? No, that's not a lie. I never said... Good God. I couldn't have said that. If I did, I'd, go, I'd gone insane. Why, I loved Evelyn better than anything in life. Boys, you've known all the old Hickey for years. You know I'd never... You know, I must have been insane, don't you? All right, we're so near the end. So the theme, um, man cannot live without illusion. Um, he needs his pipe dream. The idea of the term pipe, pipe dream actually comes from the idea of kind of an unrealistic hope or fantasy that comes from smoking an opium pipe, um, uh, which is uh, a, a neat term that starts in the 1880s in Chicago, of all places, um, where the term comes from. Um, the phrase is used many, many, many times throughout the play. One cynical reviewer said that if you eliminated those two words, the play would be an hour shorter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's true. But, um, the, the idea of the pipe dream sustains life and hope. And it's also about the idea of tomorrow and what it is that that represents. That I will get sober tomorrow. I will get my job back tomorrow. I will finally go outside tomorrow. Uh, in many ways, it's sort of like Annie. <laughs> I love you tomorrow. You're always a day. So, um, there's also a, a lot of religious symbolism that exists in this play. Um, at Harry Hope's birthday party, Hickey is at the center of the table. There are 12 people at the table around him. Uh, and they're all drinking wine. Uh, and the way that Eugene O'Neill sets it up in his stage direction, he sets it up physically so that it is going to look like Da Vinci's Last Supper. Uh, the Don Parrott character, 
Um, it's listed 12th uh, among the characters in the list of characters, uh, as Judas is listed as the 12th disciple. Um, he betrays for money. Um, the Christ or Hickey figure reads his mind and his motives. Um, and Parrot even directly compares himself to Judas, and then he commits suicide uh, at the end. So we have one last brief scene where we see the ending of the old man and the young man relationship. We're basically watching, I basically picked out everything that is his story. Um, because with a four hour and 45 minute play, um, the, the, the advertisement for this said we were going to do a staged reading of the play, um, which sadly we would not finish until we'd be done. It's more breakfast. Um, May the chair bring Hickey peace at last. The poor tortured bastard. He's lucky. It's all decided for him. I wish it was decided for me. I've never been any good at deciding things. Even about selling out, it was the tart the detective agency got after me who put it in my mind. You remember what mother's like, Larry? She makes all the decisions. She's always decided what I must do. She doesn't like anyone to be free except herself. You know, I'm really much guiltier than Hickey is. You know what I did is worse than murder. Because she is dead and yet she has to live. For a while, but she can't live long in, ja in jail. She loves freedom too much. And I can't kid myself like Hickey that she's at peace. As long as she lives, she'll never be able to forget what I've done to her, even in her sleep. She'll never have a second's peace. Jesus, Larry, can't you say something? Go! Get the hell out of life, goddamn you, before I choke it out of you! Go up! Thanks, Larry. I just wanted to be sure. I can see now it's the only possible way I can ever get free from her. I guess I've known that all my life. I ought to comfort Mother a little, too. It'll give her the chance to play the great incorruptible mother of the revolution whose only child is the proletarian. She'll be able to say, justice is done, so may all traitors die. She'll be able to say, I'm glad he's dead, long live the revolution. You know her, Larry, always a hand. Go, for the love of Christ, you mad, tortured bastard, for your own sake. Jesus, Larry. Thanks. That's kind. I knew you were the only one who could understand my side. Okay, so um, we, there's a difficulty in evaluating plays out of this period, and especially of O'Neill. Um, the play contains world-weary, cynical, detached, ironic people. But O'Neill does not actually write in a detached, weary, cynical, ironic way. Uh, O'Neill wears his heart on his sleeve. Uh, he says what he means with a heartbreaking sincerity. And I think that that sincerity, um, that level of kind of this bald sincerity makes us uncomfortable. Um, and so we think of his work as being outdated and we tend to reject it. Um, his plays contain misery and nihilism, but there's also this warmth and this humor, the spirit of camaraderie um, and community that exists within the world of the people who inhabit the bar, um, <clears throat> I think it's really um, touching and inspiring. And the play sounds depressing because it is depressing, um, but <clears throat> the characters who inhabit this world endure. <clears throat> As individuals, when things are hopeless, we are conditioned to look for hope, even to manufacture hope um, when it doesn't exist. It's the pipe dream that keeps us from jumping off the fire escape. If you think about the nation, America is sort of built on the illusion that everyone has an equal access to opportunity. It's our ultimate pipe dream. And the ugly truth when class, race, gender, other differences motivate privilege and prejudice, we are confronted with that truth um, all of the time. When we think about, uh, on an even broader scale, we think about humanity, and we think about humanity's basic goodness, <clears throat> we are constantly confronted on an almost daily basis with mankind's capability for cruelty and destruction. So, when the personal truth, the national truth, and the human truth becomes unbearable, what alternative is there? Um, so, ultimately, O'Neill argues, I think, that pipe dreams are better than despair. That's it. So, um, thanks. Uh, so now we have a little bit of time to chat about the play. Do you have any questions?
guess. So how exhausting is it as an actor to do this play? Well, well doing something like um, like doing the Iceman Comet uh, is um, it's just, it's a marathon, yeah. and the idea of, of doing a play that is that is almost five hours long <clears throat> that that really requires three intermissions um, is is astounding. The, just the amount of of time that takes. Um, a lot of these characters also essentially don't leave the stage. They're on there for that entire time. And because uh, the, the characters are living in this world of everything is oppressive and, and the world outside is so hateful, it is a draining experience. Uh, I, I've only acted in one O'Neill play, um, but I, I, I found it just to be a, a, a remarkably, it was an exhausting time. Uh, I can't imagine how the how they did eight shows a week of this uh, off Broadway. Yeah, it would be, I don't know how you would do, that's a lot of time. What, you put it. I wonder what time the matinee is. <laughs> 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 what do you do in the morning? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 think, on, I think on their double data, I think they started at like noon and six or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were talking earlier about the repetition that was used. Yeah. Uh, can, when I read it, I noticed that there were a lot of repeated phrases. There. Yes. Um, like the term, you know, there's no percentage in this. Uh-huh. There's a variety of them, a pipe dream, obviously. Awesome. Um, is that something that is considered to be um, also how it shaped sort of the thinking, uh, what am I trying to say, the thought patterns of the culture or um, I think it, it's interesting in sort of how, how someone like O'Neill writes. He, he writes in, ultimately his dialogue is so very realistic and the characters that he creates are so realistic and the dialogue is so realistic, yet it's almost like he can't trust realism to get his point across. And so he feels that he has to emphasize and repeat the most important points. There's a, a kind of a standard sometimes in writing where that um, you, you need to say something three times before an audience is going to get it. Or you, 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 that, that idea, that was kind of traditional playwriting. Um, and O'Neill will say something three times right in a row. Uh, and then later, so you don't forget it, he'll say it three times in a row again. And then he'll have another character say, almost essentially paraphrasing that same thing three times in a row. The idea of him using these repeated ideas. He also has characters repeating a phrase like pipe dream. And it's not that the phrase was unusual, but every single character uses it and uses it independently. It's not like they have a group discussion where they all talk about pipe dream is going to be our word for the day, and then they all <laughs> use that. It's new people walk in and then they start talking about pipe dreams. Um, or they'll be talking about the past and the idea of pipe dreams, quoting somebody from the past as well. And so the idea of using this phrase pulls us out of reality in order for him to make what he feels is a grander statement. Um, he wants, so his characters and the world that he creates is still one, while well, based absolutely in a naturalistic, realistic world, is one that is eminently theatrical uh, as well. And it lives on a higher plane. Uh, and so I think he uses that repetition for that way. Yes, sir. I'm tempted to read something that Harold Bloom wrote in 87 about this, but it's so academic. Could you elaborate on the Negroes? pipe dream and how he steps away from it and how he comes back to it? Sure. Yeah, there's a character named Joe Mott. Um, he, uh, apparently, what he, according to him, he ran a, um, a colored gambling house um, years prior. And he's now sort of an inhabitant of the bar and hangs around. Um, and they sort of talk about him as, um, they sort of basically accept him as a white character. And so he sort of talks about that. Um, when everybody's dreams are going well, um, they sort of, he talked about that, you know, that, and he talked about in his past, the reason he was successful is because he was accepted as essentially a white man. Um, when things start to go bad and people start turning on themselves, the pipe dreams allow this sense of cohesion and community. When the pipe dreams start to disintegrate, everybody becomes, it becomes much more of a, everybody is on their own. And everyone then starts to attack each other. And many of the characters attack his, his character. And they start referring to him um, by the N-word. They start use, they start referring to his color, specifically. Um, and they start basically saying he doesn't have a right to be there. 
Um, and so when he then, his pipe dream, which is that you know, he's going to go out tomorrow and he's going to reestablish his connections and he's going to open up a uh, colored gambling house again. Um, his, there is a, a, a deep-seated hatred that exists, a mutual hatred between the white characters and the black character, they, and they both articulate that um, in an increasing, uh, so they, it's getting to the point of something terribly violent is going to happen. Um, and then he is sort of reclaimed at the end where everything goes back to the way it was, where everybody forgets what they said about each other. Um, and it's just like, it, like it never happened. Um, and I think his character, I think, then is in many ways, I think, probably the most tragic because this, the line that he is having to live, knowing how he feels about those people and how everybody else in that world feels about him, um, how he has to bury that in order to actually survive on a day-to-day -day basis, I think is really, really heartbreaking. And I think it makes it a problematic play to produce when you do it now because the, the, the racial hatred is so clear and, and articulated so with, with such venom. Um, and, and also, I think, his hatred of the white characters is articulated just as strongly. Um, he's not treated as a victim uh, in any way, um, because he always, uh, when he's attacked, he always stands up and speaks back strongly, forcefully, and articulately, articulately back to the people. But, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating character. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes, Isn't there also a bit of misogynistic um, Red runner. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot. Well, the three, the three female characters in the play are, are prostitutes. Um, and there's an interesting gradation of prostitution that exists because they want to be referred to as tarts. Um, and they get very, very angry if they're called whores. Um, and that sort of goes along the pipe dream thing as well. One of the bartenders of the bar um, is their pimp. Um, and he does not like being called a pimp. He just sort of looks after them. And this sort of, it's more of a brother-sisterly relationship. Um, and they're warm and kind and attentive to each other. Once the pipe dream goes away, it's much more of a, where's my money, and I'll beat you if you don't bring me more money. Um, and they turn, then they turn into pimps and whores. When the pipe dream is reestablished, they shift back again. And they are, they're, well, they're just tarts. They're, and and, it's, and they're, they are, they are there, they're part of the family, they're part of the community. One of them even plays the piano for the birthday. Um, and so they are, they are um, but women in O'Neill are always very difficult. He had such issues with his mother. Um, long Day's Journey into Night, looking at sort of the, the relationship between the, 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 the younger son and the mother, um, it, it's really, really troubled. Um, and, uh, and so... O'Neill's relationship with all women was pretty difficult. Uh, and certainly this play, I mean, it shows kind of this, and even the, the, the two um, wife-mother figures, we sort of have one who is essentially a saint, uh, Hickey's, Hickey's wife, is always presented in that way as being this woman who is, um, has no sin and then sort of has to be sacrificed in order for, for her husband to find happiness. And then we would almost feel that she'd be okay with that. Um, and so it's not like there's like a realistic female voice that we hear within those plot within the plays. There, there's a phrase that you don't hear as much anymore, but that you one used to hear that for occasions like this where people are drinking and drinking and drinking and it devolves, as you've just described, it's just the booze talking. And and things would be if not forgiven, at least sort of brushed away. It was just the booze talking. Well, that's interesting that here we have almost the reverse of that. Yeah. Because when these truths are revealed, and when everybody starts saying these hateful, awful things to each other, it's when the booze is not having an exactly. impact on them. <laughs> so uh, it's when they're drunk, they're all happy. Uh, everybody is remarkably a happy drunk within this play. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and is able to sustain, essentially, the same level of happy drunkenness over days and days and days of time. Um, but yeah, it's only when they, uh, when they sober up and when uh, their sobering is sort of equated with the truth, um, that's when they turn evil and mean and vile to each other, uh, when they can't escape because they don't know. Yeah. Would you say that the kind of the, I guess the historical political vision of 1912 is, ac is accurate to the time or is it more of a 
looking back at that time from the perspective of somebody that's 25, 30 years older? Uh, well, certainly some of the some of the politics that they're specifically referencing, as far as the anarchist and the socialist movements, um, which they talk about throughout the play, how they talk about it historically is certainly accurate. It seems like the viewpoint toward them feels like someone looking. It seems like an older man looking back on his innocent youth. Um, once we all did that, and we believed so fervently, and now we realize how ridiculous all of that was, that it made no difference. Um, so I, I think there, there's a little bit of both. I think there is, it is rooted in the reality of that time period. But, and you know, they also, the, 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 on the local political level, there's the Tammany, uh, the Tammany Hall, the political corruption that's there. And the owner of the bar, Harry Hope, was connected into Tammany, um, and so, uh, so that we certainly have that local politics that existed and was certainly less of an issue because Tammany was pretty much gone by the time we get to the late 1930s. And so uh, it sort of is looking back. And it's interesting that on that look back, sometimes it's looking back almost as if we're looking back nostalgically at a simpler, easier time. And also, it, but it's also then looking back at kind of the horrors of, I don't know, maybe it's almost a way of maybe we could have done something. If we'd made different choices, then life would be different now. Um, good. Anything else? I know we're running close on the end of time. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about this play, um, O'Neill sort of thought of himself as a physician, attempting to heal society's ills. In the realistic movement, that's sort of one of the things that the, the movement was focused on. Um, since uh, Nietzsche declared the, the death of God in 1882, um, one of the things that O'Neill was, was talking about in all of his works, and I think in Ice Man Cometh, is that we, didn't, we have never found a replacement for God. Uh, materialism doesn't do it. Um, uh, and so that idea of of we need something. Um, this play reveals that, that desperate need of having something to believe in, and that hope that tomorrow is somehow going to be better. What we see in these characters is we see very clearly it is never going to be better. It is a, they are lying to themselves, they are lying to each other, they are going to be worse tomorrow and worse the day after that, and they're all going to die soon, and nobody's going to care. Um, and I think that's revealed very clearly in the play. But in order to survive, those characters have to keep lying to each other. And that idea of what are we going to find to replace faith? We don't have that faith anymore. We only have lies if we're going to survive. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that's why the Irish drink so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Guys. Thanks so much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.